In this unit, we're going to talk about the parasympathetic or muscarinic, I'm going to use those terms interchangeably, physiology and pharmacology, focusing on the neurotransmitters, their production, uh, synaptic cleft function, as well as the uh, receptors at the end effector junction. In this graphic, you can see the, the concept that I won't be going, spending a lot of time talking about the anatomy. Um, that's something that you could study elsewhere, but I do review the cranial nerves that, that do control uh, certain aspects of the autonomic nervous system, uh, but point out that the, the nerves are really um, controlling the location of the action of the parasympathetic nervous system, the cholinergic muscarinic receptors are on these tissues. And this tends to be, it's defined as a cranial and sacral outflow. Um, and that is, uh, so you can see a lot of tissues are, are dressed in this way. Um, and we will be talking about some of the, the major ones uh, that I highlighted before as we go through this. I'd like to simply introduce you to the concept of the type of cholinergic receptors that are act activated by acetylcholine, um, not because uh, we really have a lot of clinical um, drugs that we use that distinguish between um, anything more, any of the muscarinic subtypes, for example, on the left. Uh, we'll not be talking about the nicotinic receptors. That's, that's subject for another topic, uh, except to note that the uh, neuromuscular junction is blocked by a, a competitive antagonist uh, called uh, detubocurarine, which is sort of the prototypical drug in that category. There are some ganglionic blockers as well. Um, those are not used very much uh, in veterinary medicine, and so I won't be spending a lot of time talking about those. What I do think is useful for you to recognize because it helps you understand the diversity of the clinical effects of stimulation of acetylcholine is that within the tissues you can have five different subtypes shown here and I'll, I'll lay out later how they're kind of linked to different um, signal transduction systems and this becomes relevant uh, as you think about how, what's actually going on within the cell after uh, acetylcholine stimulates that cell at the end effector junction. So these are, these are subtypes of receptors at the end effector tissues. It's worth reviewing a little bit about the muscarinic uh, or acetylcholinergic synaptic transmission. And basically, again, we have the presynaptic neuron over here, and we have the end effector over here and acetylcholine is being released in vesicles and it makes its way across the synaptic cleft. This is right here. And, and it's finding muscarinic receptors and I've just put an X there to denote it could be one, two, three, four, or five. Um, it binds its receptor and then it has its action. We'll talk about it later. But I want to note that uh, very important to recognize that at the same time there's competition for this receptor for, uh, through an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase that's here. And that enzyme basically breaks down acetylcholine. It's very crucial to end the action of acetylcholine. So uh, as it gets released, it has a chance to bind the receptor. The receptor's a reversible effect. It can diffuse off be destroyed by the acetylcholinesterase and that effect goes away. Without that, uh, and we'll find, we discover this when, when we are intoxicated by drugs that inhibit the acetylcholinesterase like um, the insecticides, organophosphate insecticides, um, we can get tetanus uh, in this constant repeat, repeated stimulation of the, of the cell. Understanding a bit about the cholinesterase, uh, besides its, its physiological function, is useful. Uh, because of the presence of acetylcholinesterase, it makes AC8, acetylcholine itself a poor drug because of the um, fact that there is a, a parallel 
enzyme called butyral cholinesterase or pseudocholinesterase in the plasma. And it's not specific for acetylcholine, but it, it does a great job of breaking it down, which prevents us from giving that drug per se as, as a drug. So when we talk about cholinergic agonists, these are drugs that have been modified in order to not be destroyed by the butyral cholinesterase. Let's now review a little bit about the cellular uh, signal transduction that's, that's going on within the cell in response to acetylcholine. And so, again, we're not going to focus on it, but the nicotinic or skeletal, let's say skeletal muscle uh, uh, acetylcholine receptors uh, basically open cation channels, think of sodium entry, and muscarinic receptors um, are G-protein coupled receptors, and these G-proteins are basically of a variety of types, which we'll show in a minute, um, and so of the subtypes, this is, I don't see that this is crucial for, to understand from a clinical perspective, but I'm just providing the information. You can have some that increase inositol tri triphosphate, diacylglycerol, to alter potassium permeability. You have some that are actually antagonizing um, the action of adenylate cyclase, reducing cyclic AMP, and through this mechanism, they alter potassium channels or inhibition of calcium channels, and then some tissues such as the glands, you can have an increase of inositol triphosphate and calcium that leads to secretion. And in the vascular endothelium, we'll show examples of this, you actually get linkage to the production of nitric oxide. So to move to a more specific perspective, you know, the, um, the types of the G proteins really determines what's being linked to. So if you have a G sub Q, it's being linked to phospholipase C and its products, uh, including activation of protein kinase C and the release of intracellular calcium that has biological effects, and so does the, the formation of inositol triphosphate and diacylglycerol. Uh, if you have the so subtypes that link to the inhibitory G subunit, um, you get either the inhibition of adenylate cyclase or you get opening of potassium channels. In this cartoon, we're showing the uh, signal transduction of uh, muscarinic uh, acetylcholine receptor inter interacting with the uh, GQ subunit and stimulating phospholipase uh, C and then activating protein kinase C. You may be asking, well, this is a clinical. I thought you were going to talk about clinical stuff. And, and, and the main point here is that is all the stuff going on inside the cell, as we later on talk about the adrenergic or sympathetic nervous system, will realize that this is where the integration occurs. It might be through the mobilization of ionized calcium within the cell uh, or something like that. So just keep that in mind that, that these receptors uh, exist in each cell. The, the actual signal transduction is where the integration of the two arms of the autonomic nervous system often occur if, in fact, both are directly innervating that cell. Another common motif of action within the cell that you'll see is the uh, management of the ion. Uh, channels and management of basically the electrical potential across an excitable tissue. And I use the example here of the muscarinic receptor uh, interacting um, with the uh, G protein coupled potassium, uh, inward gated potassium uh, channel, in inward rectifying channel. And so this is just one example of many and where, where you can see that this is sort of helping to control the, the baseline rate of the heart. And then when we come along with the sympathetic nervous system, there will be all kinds of other mechanisms that are trying to lead to the polarization, to the alteration of uh, calcium mobilization, et cetera, in the opposite direction. And finally, a special signal transduction mechanism is, that I, I think is well worth mentioning because there are drugs involved in targeting this system, um, and that is the fact that acetylcholine 
and the vascular endothelium basically stimulates nitric oxide synthetase and, um, to produce nitric oxide. Nitric oxide diffuses from endothelial cells over to the smooth muscle cell, uh, binds to um, guanyl cyclase, that cyclic JMP, can then lead to rapid relaxation of smooth, smooth muscle cells. And this is a general motif that you'll find in vascular and even other smooth muscles, such as in the intestinal tract. Okay, I promised you to talk about clinical effects. So let's, let's talk about the, the main cardiovascular effects of the muscarinic stimulation. At the SA node, we, have, we will cause a reduction of heart rate. So we have a muscarinic receptor here, the SA node, and uh, reduction of rate is also called negative chronotropy. Um, you also get a reductive, a reduction of contractile strength of the atria, a decrease in refractory period, and at the AV node, um, you get a reduction of conduction velocity that will, it's control, called negative dromotropy, that's the term, and then a small decrease in contractile strength of the ventricles. So you can see the overall picture is to slow down and reduce strength of contractile uh, apparatus of the contractile apparatus of the heart. We've already talked about the effects on the on the blood vessels, most of which, whom are managed through nitric oxide. That's why you'll see, although I won't talk about it, the actual use of drugs such as nitroglycerin to lead to um, nitric oxide directly, or other drugs um, that can also lead to pro uh, products uh, that stimulate uh, the guanyl cyclase uh, are used clinically and pharmacologically. What about the bronchial tree? Well, you probably all know the overall effect of having a, an asthmatic attack. So think about basically that many, much of the bronchoconstrictive effects are, are mediated through acetylcholine. And as an addition, in a situation where you have irrit an irritation of the bronchioles, the, the secretions are going to be stimulated. So increased stimulation and increased contraction of the bronchial muscles are basically all mediated through muscarinic receptors in the bronchi and bronchial glands. Turning to the GI tract, uh, there's obviously a really important role of all of um, acetylcholine in this sort of vegetative function of the parasympathetic nervous system. Remember we said the GI tract has dominant parasympathetic tone. So with muscarinic receptors at all sites, the stomach, intestine, the bile duct, and gallbladder, and the large intestine, uh, that those sites would be here, um, you can generally see an increased uh, motility uh, contract, in other words, coordinated motility uh, and an increased relaxation of sphincters that allows propulsive movement uh, down the GI tract and increase of secretions. All of these things are going on without the brain being aware of it. That's what makes it uh, autonomic in a sense and vegetative. And uh, when we disrupt these things, as we say, when we give a, a drug that will block the muscarinic receptors, we have to expect that the GI tract could be, uh, take a, it could take a toll on the GI tract. It could lead to what we call ileus, or a condition of lack of uh, contractile uh, activity of the GI tract. Another important tissue with regards to uh, clinical applications of muscarinic agents, and that's why I'm mentioning these, is the urinary bladder. And so the bladder itself is stimulated um, by muscarinic uh, agonists, and uh, at the same time, it makes sense that the trigone and the actual sphincter uh, be relaxed. So, and this, this is actually contracting. So it's like you're contracting against uh, lower resistance, and this, uh, this is countered, as we'll talk about the sympathetic nervous system, is countered by um, the alpha receptors of the sympathetic nervous system um, having the control to increase sphincter tone. So, 
So again, basically an example of uh, opposing effects of the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system at the side of the bladder. And finally, I want to talk about uh, two uh, locations where the muscarinic um, agonists have clinical effects that we can recognize and, and actually take advantage of in clinical scenarios. And we'll talk, let's talk about the, first, the second one first, the exocrine glands. So virtually every uh, gland is going to be stimulated uh, to increase secretion. And sometimes this is something we try to counter. And we'll, we use, as we'll talk about later, muscarinic antagonists um, to do this, things like atropine. Uh, to, to lead to reduction of secretions, say, in a pre-op setting. So when we do this, um, we, we are, uh, it's one of the goals of reducing these natural secretions that are stimulated by, uh, and might be even overstimulated during a surgical scenario. Um, the eye, as we said, was, is innervated by uh, it's both the parasympathetic and sympathetic uh, nerves, but to different muscles. And so in the case of the parasympathetic nervous system, it is, this is the sphincter muscle, the sphincter muscle of the iris that leads to pupillary constriction. And um, when you go to the eye doctor, well, you'll, you'll learn that the drug that they give you is basically a muscarinic antagonist that leads to pupillary dilation. And why does it lead to pupillary dilation? It leads to that because your dominant tone is parasympathetic, uh, as we talked about in the first unit. Uh, and then the other thing you'll notice is that they tell you to bring some uh, sunglasses, and they also tell you to make sure that uh, um, you maybe have somebody help you drive because you can no longer adjust from near to far vision very well because the lens are, uh, is, and it's connected to the ciliary muscle, um, the lens and its accommodative effect, that is to become thinner or thicker, is, is regulated by the muscarinic system, and he's blocked it. So is, in these two systems, we have sort of common um, direct applications, as we'll talk about later, of clinical um, therapy.